podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7. Hey guys, welcome to another week here on Ring Around the Rosie. I'm Platinum Rose Lady, a.k.a. Kim Brown, uh, welcoming you on March 2nd, 2018. I'm sorry I'm a little late with the show this week. I had We had some uh, health issues and some computer issues and just issue issues. And now it sounds like, you know, this sounds like Armageddon outside. It's crazy. Um, I'm rec- as I'm recording this... Um, Massachusetts is having the living frog snot kicked out of it by a nor'easter that thankfully for this part of the state is all rain. I say thankfully because if it was snow, I'm pretty sure we would be up to our armpits. It's it's raining like crazy. The wind is nuts. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are being displaced from their homes um, everybody, please, in Massachusetts, if you're within the sound of my voice, please stay safe. Um, and if you don't have to go out and drive, for, for fuck's sake, don't. It's friggin' lunacy out there. Um, so this is going to be kind of a down and dirty show. It's going to be a little quicker than most because I'm just going to go over the results for the uh, pay-per-view, which was earlier in the week, and the Raw and SmackDown results. Um, The pay-per-view from last Sunday, the WWE Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, which was from Las Vegas, Nevada. Interesting little side bit of trivia. um, When this uh, pay-per-view aired in Germany, it actually had a different name. It's not called the Elimination Chamber. It's called uh, No Escape is the name of the pay-per-view. Apparently, there was concerns that people in Germany might be offended by the title Elimination Chamber, bringing up, you know, bad memories of the Holocaust and all that. Um, to my res- to which my response is, well, yeah, duh. I mean, <laughs> that kind of makes sense, don't you think? You know, Final Solution, anybody from WCW all those years back? When all of us sat there and went, holy shit, they really didn't just say that, did they? Oh, gosh, I remember those days. Man, if I had a dollar for every time I sat there watching a WCW program and went, holy crap, did they really do that? I would be so rich right now. Um, Starting things off with the uh, pre-show, uh, we had um, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson of the Balor Club facing uh, Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel from the Miz Taraj. And the winner of that... Ma- uh, match wars Gallo and Gallows and Anderson. Thank God. Um, you know, it. I like those guys. In spite of myself, I like them. I mean, they hang out with Finn, so that makes them cool anyway. But I like them. They. They just. They. They're great wrestlers. They're both really good on the mic, and they crack me up. Although the nerds thing, I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay, dude, whatever. You know, it's. <laughs> Some of us have been dealing with that shit since we were very young, and it's like, yeah, whatever, jock. You know, it's like... Um, so, that brings us to the actual show. And for the first time, we had an Elimination Chamber match featuring the WWE Lady Wrestlers, which is, you know, very cool. Um, so, it was champion Alexa Bliss versus Sasha Banks versus Mickey James versus Mandy Rose versus Sonya Deville versus Bayley in the first ever women's elimination chamber match. And I'm sorry that I'm kind of slowing down. Breathe. Okay. (laughs) Got a little lightheaded there. Wow. That's a lot to say all at once. Um, We start with Sonya Deville versus Bailey to start. And as we know, you know, there's a certain time limit and then another person is released from their uh, elimination chamber pod and they join the match and, You know, I'm sorry, not for nothing, but when your match stipulations are about as easy to follow as VCR instructions, you have a problem. Um, I know some people want to just, and and to all the people out there who just went, VCR, what's that? Shut up. I don't want to hear it. Um, Mandy Rose was the next person released from her pod, um, 
And in my notes, I have written, damn, I hate Corey Graves. So apparently Corey said something else that irritated me. Gosh, let me see. How often does that happen? Oh, pretty much every time Corey Graves opens his mouth. Um, and Sonia and uh, Mandy Rose proceeded to beat up on Bailey, which really pissed me off. And I said some words that I really, I know my mom's somewhere going, I know she's using bad language. I, 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 I won't say what the words were that I called uh, Mandy Rose or Sonia Deville, but um, I think you can figure it out. <laughs> Starts with <laughs> starts with C, ends with T, and we'll just oh look over here a shiny thing. Um, anyway, moving forward, um, Sasha Banks is released from her uh, pod, and almost immediately after that happens, Mandy Rose takes a ring post to the face, and I laugh hysterically because I have a. <laughs> Because I have a dark side that can really be scary sometimes, and I admit that. Um, uh, Mandy Rose winds up being forced to submit to Sasha Banks, and I really, really want to um, go take care of things, but it's Lent, and I can't do that. I'm Catholic. What do you want? Um, we have Mickey James released from her pod next, and Mickey winds up pinning Sonya Deville. Uh, so that gets rid of uh, Absolution, since Paige, unfortunately, cannot wrestle in the WWE right now. Um, Bailey winds up pinning Mickey James, which I have to be honest, I was like, okay, that, uh, all right. I mean, I was happy about it, because I like Bailey. Unlike my, my guy, who, for, for some reason, does not like Bailey. I like Bailey. I think she's, I think she's a great wrestler. I think she's a fantastic, um, role model for young girls. Not that I would know what that would be be like to be a role model for anybody because I would never want, I would never tell any girl to emulate me. Oh, fuck, that's a horrible idea. Um, but I like Bailey. I think she's cool. Um, and following that, we have Alexa Bliss being released from her pod, although it seemed to take her an awful long time to get out of it, you know. Um, play, Alexa's very good at playing the cowardly heel. Uh, she's very good at that. Uh, Bailey winds up being pinned by, uh, Alexa. And Sasha winds up being pinned by Alexa. And the winner of the match, and still WWE Women's Champion, Alexa Bliss. Alexa is interviewed in the ring after her match by Renee. And... It actually started off as a pretty interesting interview where she's actually acting like a human being before she turned into a turbo bitch again. Um, and I realized that's her job. And she must be really good at it because every time she talks, I want to smash her in the face with a brick. Um, her character. Alexa's character. I would like to specify that. You know, it, it's just going to make it all the more sweeter when when she finally has to face someone like Asuka who's going to dismember her, you know, and, and I'm going to enjoy it immensely. Um, I'm sorry, Alexa just reminds me of all the mean girls I ever went to school with that I wanted to fling down a flight of stairs. Um, I was in a very dark place in high school. Uh, following that, we had a match with uh, The Bar, Cesaro and Sheamus, the tag team champions, going against Titus O'Neil and Apollo because he's now just called Apollo because they dropped the cruise off of his name um, for well I can't, I've heard rumors about why, I don't want to speculate on that because I'm not sure of the of how exact those rumors are, so I'll just leave it there um they were obviously accompanied by Dana Brooke doing her best Alexa York impression still. Although I gotta say, um, Dana's another one of these women. I see her come down to the ring and she can really run in heels. And I know it sounds like a stupid thing to be impressed with, but I watch a woman run in heels and I'm always like, fuck me. Because I, I, I can't wear heels. I, I've never been able to wear heels in my entire life. I think if I sat, if I tried to sit down wearing a pair of heels, I'd fall out of the chair. I just, I really am bad with heels. And I see other women walk in heels. I'm like, wow. I see women run in heels. 
I'm like, fuck me, I'm impressed. Um, the match ended with uh, the uh, the bar winning and retaining their, their belts. Uh, following that, we had a match with uh, As- uh, Asuka against Nia Jax. And the point of the stipulation with this match was that if Nia Jax won, she would be added to the uh, match that Asuka has with Alexa Bliss at uh, WrestleMania 34. Um, for the most part, the match was pretty much mostly um, Nia Jax. But when she tried to do a, uh, a power bomb on Asuka, Asuka was able to reverse it into a roll up and wound up getting the pin, which I was super excited about because I think Asuka is awesome. After the match was done, N- uh, Nia Jax, proving what kind of a woman she is, uh, attacked Asuka and put her through a ringside barrier. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. That, that's really honorable. Jump somebody after the match is over, bitch. Um, following that was a match between Woken Matt Hardy, because he's Woken now, not broken. I, I'm sorry. I can only come up with three words that rhyme. It's Woken, Broken, or Token. And Token Matt Hardy sounds like something... We don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. That's all I got, though. Um, with... Um, Matt Hardy going against Bray Wyatt. Um, and this, I mean, it was a good match. It's not that it wasn't a good match because they both put on, you know, they both do great work. It's just, seriously, this whole who's crazier than who thing, I'm like, you know, I just, I know, I'm like, girls, you're both pretty. Knock it off. <laughs> um, Matt winds up uh, employing the twist of fate on, on Bray Wyatt and gets the pin. Um, I still don't get the Sweeney Todd hair thing Matt's got going. I don't get the weird accent. I don't get why it looks like he's now brushing his teeth with whiteout because his teeth are a color that does not occur in nature. But whatever, you be you. Um, or you be you trying to be Johnny Depp being Sweeney Todd or whatever you're doing because I'm not entirely sure. Uh, this led into the contract signing for... MMA uh, fighter and all-around kick-ass person Ronda Rousey, who is going to be signing with Raw. Um, Kurt Angle, the general manager of Raw and commissioner of Raw, WWE, bane of my existence, Stephanie McMahon and her husband, Triple H, were in the ring, and they introduced Ronda, who came out to the crowd pretty much being kind of excited ish I'm sorry this crowd was dead I I, I really I, and that's really weird because Vegas is usually a pretty good crowd but I was sitting there going did all these people like you know I know it's hot in Vegas but does everybody have heat stroke or something I just I, I really felt like the crowd was kind of dead most of the most of the evening um Before Rhonda actually signed her contract, though, um, that uh, things got a little bit strange when Kurt Angle brought up what happened back at WrestleMania 31, which, for those of you who don't remember, um, was Rhonda Rousey being in the ring at the same time as The Rock and the both of them embarrassing Stephanie and Triple H, which and which at the time ended with um, with Ronda putting Stephanie in in an arm bar and looking like she was going to rip Stephanie's arm off and beat her over the head with it. And I was sitting there going, "Oh God, oh God, yes, oh God, do it, oh God, please." And of course, it didn't happen because we can't have nice things. Um, so. Kurt's talking about this and talking about how Triple H and Stephanie were now happy to sign Rhonda because once they signed her, they could, you know, basically own her and keep her down and get revenge on her for what she did. Now, during all of this, of course, Triple H and Stephanie are both looking at Kurt like, what the fuck are you doing? And Kurt's just kind of 
rambling on happily about this stuff. You know, kind of like that drunk uncle at your Christmas party every year, the one that gets drunk and starts talking about shit that happened, you know, 30 years ago between your dad and some other woman that's not your mom. You know, that kind of shit. Um, Triple H tries to uh, smooth the waters because Rhonda's looking more and more like, I need to hurt somebody. And um, the more they tried to make it easier, the more the more shit angles stir it up. Um, the end of this whole thing involved Rhonda grabbing Triple H and putting him through a table, you know, in a, in a move that, um, oh, God. Um, I, I was like, oh, God, please. Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, please, yes. And then it actually happened. So apparently sometimes we do get nice things. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the table wasn't, you know, covered in barbed wire and on fire because, sadly, those days are gone. Damn, I miss ECW. Uh, Stephanie McMahon then does probably the dumbest thing that I've ever seen a person do, you know, besides, you know, anybody who walks around Boston wearing a Yankee shirt. She then slaps Ronda Rousey, and, and after slapping her, proceeds to bitch her out some more. Because... Stephanie's kind of fucking stupid that way. Um, Rhonda, to her credit, did not rip Stephanie's head off her shoulders in a bloody geyser fountain, which I would have enjoyed. I mean, fuck it, it's pay-per-view. What are we paying for? Um, Although she did look at Stephanie with a look that basically, if looks could kill, Stephanie McMahon would have been a charred-up pile of ashes on the ring floor, on the, you know, on the, on the, uh, in the ring, and I would have laughed till I threw up. Um, Stephanie managed to get out of the ring without Rhonda killing her as Rhonda went over and signed the contract. I think it would have been funnier myself, me personally, if she'd ripped up the contract, said, fuck you, I'm going to SmackDown, and left. I mean, that, I would have laughed. I would have laughed myself sick. We get the main event next, which was the first time they've ever done a seven-man elimination chamber because we had all of the confusion earlier on, you know, in the weeks leading up to it with this person joining and that person, and all of a sudden we've got all these people. We've got seven people going to be in a match that usually has six. Are we going to have people in, like, you know, two men in one pod, and will the internet break from all of the fan fiction? So, um, we have the people that are involved in said match, which would include uh, The Miz, Elias, John Cena, Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, and Roman Reigns. Um, I have to be honest, this was good. It was really a good match. Um, it was enjoyable, and, and, you know, I liked it a lot. Um... We begin with um, the the beginning of the match, which was uh, the Miz against um, uh, Seth Rollins. They started it off um, and kept having people come in after that. Obviously, the next person, well, as I said, the Miz was f- the first person going against Seth Rollins. Uh, following that, we had um, Finn Balor came in next. Following that, John Cena. Uh, Braun Strowman, uh, Roman Reigns, and Elias came in seventh because he had won a match a few weeks earlier on Raw. Um, it was a lot of running around. As far as The Miz was concerned, it was a lot of trying to avoid being murdered by Braun Strowman, which, you know, is pretty, you know, I mean, that I really, I can't really fault the guy for that because, I mean... Braun Strowman is a big, scary individual, and I really wouldn't want him putting his hands all over me in public uh, like that anyway, because, you know, because he's a big, scary man. Um, The eliminations of the Elimination Chamber are as follows. Um, The Miz was the first person eliminated by Braun Strowman, followed by Elias, who was eliminated by Braun Strowman, uh, John Cena, uh, Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, and then we were down to Braun Strowman against Roman Reigns, and the winner of the match going on to face Brock Lesnar at uh, WrestleMania is Roman Reigns. 
And I realize that a whole bunch of people on the internet proceeded to scream and yell and bang their feet and stomp their feet and shake their fists and so on and so forth, to which I say, fuck off. Um, because I just don't understand all the hate for Roman. I mean, I do... I don't... I, I, I tell a lie. I know why some men don't like Roman Reigns, and it's the same reason that some men don't like John Cena, and back in the day it was the same reason some men didn't like Shawn Michaels. Jealousy. They know that their women are thinking about Roman Reigns when they're fucking their women because that's the only way their women can stay awake. Deal. Um, I have to bring up one thing that was said during the... Um, during the the elimination chamber match with um, the Miz at one point where he was fleeing and I mean fleeing from Braun Strowman trying to get away from him including climbing up the side of the cage the elimination chamber is in and there was a remark made about King Kong uh, in regards to the Miz and and Braun Strowman um, which I was very offended by because Faye Ray uh, faced King Kong with much more bravery than The Miz was facing Braun Strowman. So there's that. Um, as I said, for the most part, I'm sorry, the crowd just seemed really dead. I mean, there were a few times they were excited. It never seemed to last very long, though. I mean, that's just my opinion for what it's worth. I mean, maybe people who were there can can say that, you know, oh, no, you're not being fair. It was a real, you know, the crowd was really into it because you can't tell if you're not there. I mean, you really can't. So following that up, we had uh, the 26th of February's uh, Raw, uh, which started off with Alexa Bliss and her new best friend or old best friend or whatever, uh, Mickey James in the ring and Alexa still fucking talking. Uh, the whole thing turned into a big Donnie Brook when um, Alexa's mouth finally called out Asuka. And Asuka came out and, you know, basically told Alexa off, you know. I mean, Asuka's English may not be perfect, but she gets her point across. And if she's basically saying she's going to kick your ass, she's going to do it. Uh, it turns into an entire mess between Alexa um Mickey and Nia, uh, Nia Jax, who comes out to start trouble with Asuka again, um, who gets a save from Bailey and Sasha, but unfortunately the heels wind up triumphing over that section. Um, we get a match out of this, though, with uh, Asuka, Sasha, and Bailey going against Alexa, Mickey, and Nia, um, which the faces wind up winning. Um, I found it very interesting, though, because there was a point during the Elimination Chamber match the night before where, um, and, and Corey Graves, who would not shut the fuck up about it, where it seemed like Sasha had stabbed Bailey in the back as they kept putting it. I'm like, it's an Elimination Chamber match. How much more, like, every person for themselves do you want shit to go, you know? But considering the fact that for some reason that I can't quite figure out, Corey Graves has this mad on for um, Sasha Banks where he basically does everything but accuse her of murdering kittens. Um, and I think if he thought he could get away with saying that, he would. Um, but he just went on and on and on about how she stabbed Bailey in the back and she's a glory hound and she's this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. I thought it was interesting that during the six man, the six woman tag team match on Raw, uh, there was a point where Bailey was um, did not tag Sasha, refused to. Sasha was trying to get in, you know, get out of the ring and tag in Bailey, and Bailey refused. I don't want to see this turn into a feud between Sasha and Bailey. I really don't. I'd like there. I'd like because it's so predictable for that to happen. I'd prefer. Something more along the lines of, okay, we're competitors and we can be competitors and we can be fierce competitors, but we can still be friends. I mean, you know, baseball players and football players and all that, you have teams that have, you know, huge storied rivalries, but the players on the other, t on each team, they don't hate each other, you know, I'm assuming, 
you know, unless it's the Yankees. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was a joke. That was a joke to any Yankee fans. I'm sorry. It's a Boston thing. It's, you know, it's knee-jerk reaction. We can't help it. Um, John Cena came out and uh, ran a, did a promo talking about how he... Um, he failed the night before at the Elimination Chamber, and the audience basically was like, yeah, you failed. You know, the audience is basically being a bunch of shits. I mean, I gotta be honest. I look at, I, I see wrestling fans at some of these shows now, and I'm like, why do you people show up? Seriously. It seems like all these people do is show up and be obnoxious. I'm like, that's not what being a wrestling fan's about. You're supposed to be there and have fun. You know, why do you have to, and why do you have to make it all about you? You know, it's, it's one thing if fans are, you know, make up a cool chant or something like that, or somebody dresses in a really crazy way, you know, you know what I mean. But it just seems to me some people really try and make the show all about them and not the people in the ring busting their ass trying to be entertaining. And I just, I mean, that's just my own take on it. I just remember thinking, man, this is a classy crowd. Um, John went on and was talking about what he wants to do for WrestleMania, um, which was the fact that he challenged The Undertaker. Um, he said that he was told, though, that the match wasn't happening. Um and that he was going to, instead of going to WrestleMania and challenging The Undertaker, he would be at SmackDown and earn a place to re in WrestleMania, whatever that means. Um, to which, my response to all of that was, if they were serious about Taker not coming back, this never would have gotten brought up. I mean, that's just my take on it. I guess we'll have to wait and see, you know, what happens. But that's just my take on the whole thing. Um, we had a match with, um, well, it was supposed to be a match, with um, Bray Wyatt coming out to go against Heath Slater. Instead, he just starts beating the shit out of both Heath and Rhino before the match even occurs. And then starts going into this whole kind of, you know, other place where he goes in his head and kisses Heath and gives him a sister Abigail. Um, just once I'd like to see um, Bray Wyatt go to kiss somebody and before he kisses them, they kiss him with tongue. I want to see this happen. I want to see what would happen if it did happen. Um, and of course, my usual thing that happens every time Bray Wyatt comes out, me sitting there looking at the screen going, okay, you're evil, we get it. Um, somebody gave Bray a microphone, thanks for that. And he starts talking about how he's going to, you know, ruin Matt Hardy, and it's all Matt Hardy's fault that these guys got beat up, and blah, 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 and all this stuff like that, and yeah, 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 you're either worlds, worlds, blah, 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 yada, yada, flambe, whatever. We are then treated, treated, Dr. Evil quotes, um, to the Miz coming out and shooting off his mouth about how much of a big star he is, and so on and so forth, etc., etc., blah, blah. Um, it turns out, though, that all of his talking has wound up leading up to a match, and the match is between um, The Miz and Seth Rollins, um, which Seth Rollins ma manages to win with the frog splash. And after the match, out comes somebody else, the other person being Finn Balor, who also has a match against The Miz. Um... The thing is, the match doesn't actually occur the way it's supposed to because the Miz Taraj jump on Bal Finn and start beating him up, which brings out um, Gallows and Anderson, who start fighting with um, Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel. Um, Miz goes to attack Finn. Kurt Angle appears on the Titan Tron and tells the Miz Taraj and the... the um, Gallows and Anderson, they gotta go. And Miz needs to have a real match right now with Finn. And if he doesn't, 
he's not going to get to compete at WrestleMania. So we get The Miz going against uh, Finn Balor, which Finn wins with um, pretty relative ease, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, we have Roman Reigns come out, and he did one of the best promos he's done in a long-ass time. Talking about the fact that Brock Lesnar, uh, the champion, was actually in Vegas the evening before. Um, but the reason he didn't uh, come out to the ring was because he was too busy hanging out with Dana White. Roman brought up that uh, Brock doesn't respect Roman. Brock doesn't respect the fans. And Brock doesn't respect the WWE. And you know what? He's not wrong. Every time I watch a Brock Lesnar match, you look in his eyes. There is no passion for this. This is just a job to him. It's just a means to an end, a means to a paycheck. And I'm sorry, fuck that noise. I want to see somebody in the ring who wants to be there. And that somebody is Roman Reigns. That somebody is Finn Balor. That somebody is Seth Rollins or Dean Ambrose. Fuck it, it's even somebody like The Miz. And I can't stand The Miz, which is his job. But I don't get that passion from Lesnar. I never have. And I think putting the belt on him is a mistake. I think keeping the belt on him for this long is ludicrous. And I really hope Roman takes it off of him at WrestleMania. Um, we have a match with uh, Titus um, Worldwide, again, against the bar, Cesaro and Sheamus. Which, uh, it was a two out of three falls match, which um, wound up being won by the bar. Um, who get on the mic after they're done, uh, talking about how they have beaten everybody um, and that they're not going to have anybody to face at WrestleMania because they have beaten everybody. So I'm not sure if that means a new tag team's coming in or whatever. Um, following that was a, um, was the, I'm sorry, I'm, my memory's a little bit off on this because I'm trying to, I'm going by my notes and stuff. Um, uh, following that, we were supposed to be having a match between Braun Strowman and Elias um, with more blah, blah from Elias. Um, and I got to be perfectly honest and tell you, I would rather step, I would rather walk barefoot on a, in a carpet made of Legos than walk with Elias. So there's that. Um, Braun Strowman winds up winning the match with Elias by DQ because Elias sprayed him with a fire extinguisher. Um, why? I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, maybe it's just me and I, and I don't understand things, but I, I would assume that if you have a fire extinguisher and you have somebody coming at you like Braun Strowman, hit him with it. Don't spray him with the foam or the powder or whatever comes out of it fucking hit him with it. It's a fucking metal cylinder, you dumbass. Um, once the DQ was called, uh, Braun tried to put Elias through the commentator's table, and unfortunately, he, Elias got away. Um, Braun wound up losing him in a chase through the parking lot. You'd think it wouldn't be too hard to find some terrified hipster running for his life, but whatever. Um, Finally, we had the whole situation again with Ronda Rousey and Triple H and Stephanie trying to uh, do some damage control about what happened the evening before. Um, Stephanie lays the blame for everything on Kurt because he was sick and Ronda acted the way she did because she's used to that sort of thing from her time in MMA. Um, Stephanie says that now that Rhonda, however, has signed her contract, that she reports to Stephanie and she needs to learn where her place is in the company. 
Yeah, that worked really well for your dad in Stone Cold Steve Austin, didn't it, honey? I mean, your your dad basically had Austin under contract, and Austin did some pretty heinous shit to your old man. Just just saying. Um, she tells Kurt Angle to come out to the ring and apologize, but Rhonda comes out with Angle, who was trying to stop her. Um. The whole thing basically ended with, unfortunately, not Stephanie McMahon being loaded into an ambulance. Um, she said Stephanie needed to apologize to her or she would rip Stephanie's arm out of the socket. Stephanie apologizes as many times as humanly possible and welcomes Rhonda into the WWE and gets the fuck out of the ring as quickly as you can without your name being Barry Allen. Um, Triple H manages to do, get a cheap shot in on Kurt and leaves with Stephanie. Um, as, un, as I said, Stephanie's arm was not ripped out of the socket by Rhonda. See, once again, we can't have nice things. <sighs> Lead me right to the edge and then just leave me hanging. Thanks a lot, WWE. Uh, following that on the uh, 27th was uh, SmackDown. With John Cena opening the show, saying that he wants to be in the Fatal Five Way at uh, the Fast Lane pay per view, the SmackDown pa- uh, Fast Lane pay per view for the belt. Uh, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan came out and think that that's a good idea. And if Cena can beat AJ Styles tonight, he'll get a spot on the t- in the title match at Fast Lane. Um, we had a match with uh, Baron Corbin defeating Sami Zayn, which I can't really care about either of these people. I'm sorry. I just, you know, I, I'm sorry. I can't. Um, Ruby Riot from the Riot Squad. Oh, name is so catchy. I roll. Um, had a match with Naomi. Ruby Riot w- uh, winning. We had a promo in the back with New Day, the team of um, uh, Fandango and uh, Tyler Breeze of the team of Breezango. Oof. I would like to get a hold of whoever came up with that name and just shake them. Um, and um, actor Josh Duhamel, um, who is playing a detective... De- investigating the deaths of uh, Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur in a USA series that's going to be airing pretty soon. And wow, look, Josh Duhamel's here. I would have been bugging him about being in the Transformer movies myself, but that's just me. Um, we get an in-ring promo from the Usos, and uh, which, I'm um, sorry, bring, bring, we get an in-ring promo from the New Day, which brings out the Usos. Um, and it just, you know, is kind of this whole back and forth thing. Um, the Bludgeon Brothers came out after them as um, Harper and Rowan came in the ring with their large hammers in hand. Ahem. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know why I decided to go there. I, just, it's late. Um, we had a, a promo of Dolph Ziggler on his phone. Um, I, I, I hate these new, the promos with people talking into their phones. I, I just, that's so amateurish. It looks so amateurish, WWE. Stop it. It's just, I, I can't stand it. Um, we have an interview backstage with Bobby Roode talking about how he wants to prove that he is, you know, one of the best wrestlers out there right now. And that in order for that to happen, he has to defeat the Viper, Randy Orton, which of course... You know, speak of the devil and then he comes. Um, Randy tells Bobby he will run straight through him. I have to be honest, I think that's going to be a great feud. If they, if they take it into an actual feud territory, I think it could be very cool. Um, we had a match with one of the, with the man who has the best entrance theme in wrestling right now, and I will fight you on this, Shinsuke Nakamura, who has the best entrance theme in for the past, I'd say, 10 years, uh, going against Aiden English and uh, Nakamura winning. Thank God. Um, John Cena's match with AJ Styles ended with Cena winning. 
and Cena is now part of the fatal five way match at Fastlane. After the match, uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn uh, came down to ringside. And while Cena's trying to deal with them and see what they're up to, Baron Corbin shows up and starts beating on Cena from behind. Uh, the three of them, Owens, uh, Zayn, and Corbin, start beating up on AJ and John until Dolph Ziggler comes down and gives Owens a super kick to the face, gives uh, Zayn a super kick, and Corbin uh, out you know, to get rid of them. And AJ then turns around and goes to give, he gives um, AJ a super kick, but when he tries to give Cena a super kick, he gets a, an attitude adjustment for his pains. So, um, obviously the next, you know, the big next big pay-per-view, well, the next pay-per-view is the Fastlane pay-per-view, the um, SmackDown pay-per-view before WrestleMania. Now, a few things have come out recently um, uh, talking about things that are banned from the upcoming WrestleMania. Now, this, this is rumor, so these are rumored things that have been banned, so it may not be completely accurate, but I, I just thought this was an interesting thing to bring up. Blood, for one thing, is from what I've heard is being banned the entire week of WrestleMania shows and things like that, you know, which disappoints me. I mean, we've we've definitely, you know, moved past the days when you'd see the odd crimson mask every now and again. And do I miss that? You have no idea how much. Also banned from WrestleMania, beach balls. Um, to be honest, the beach ball thing, I understand. I do. Um, this is not a fucking Jimmy Buffett concert. I think bringing beach balls to an event where people are in the ring and could literally break their neck, break their back, split open their head, or anything like that while they're trying to provide you with entertainment and you're out there flinging around a beach ball like some reject from a a Frankie Avalon and Ned Funicello movie, fuck you. That is wicked fucking disrespectful. Sorry, it's just my own opinion. Also, from what I've heard, iPads are supposed to be banned from WrestleMania. Now, that one, I'm a little bit like, how are you going to do that? More to the point, why are you going to do that? Um, I think they might be worried about people recording stuff. I mean, you know, someone... But my thing is, fuck it, you could record the whole show on your phone if you've got a fancy enough phone, at least... I'm assuming you can because I don't know shit about that kind of stuff. Sorry. Um, so, are you guys excited for WrestleMania? I'd love to know. Um, if you have any questions or comments or queries or complaints or anybody you think should be pushed that isn't or is being that's not, uh, if you'd like to send a uh, missive to me, you may do so. You can send it to PlatinumRoseL at Yahoo.com. And put uh, Ring Around the Rosie in the header, and I'll know you want me to read it for the show, and I will definitely do that. I hope you will check out the other shows that are part of our crazy family um, of podcasts and such. Those would include Subject Cinema, which is a movie podcast that is done by me and TC. Uh, We've been doing this podcast for over 10 years. Holy crap. And we talk about movies and movie reviews and all kinds of fun things. Um, this upcoming month is always a fun month for us. Um, and by fun, I mean painful. Um, we have something called Masochistic March, which we do every March. Duh. Um, where we watch bad movies. Really bad movies. Um, the last couple of times we've done this, we've focus on a specific type like martial arts movies or musicals or things like that. This year, (laughs) and I got to admit this is my fault, um, Masochistic March this year, we are looking at Star Wars knockoffs because I am a huge Warsy uh, and I figured I can take the pain, I think. So (laughs) we're going to be looking at Star Wars ripoff movies on Masochistic March on Subject Cinema. I hope you'll check that out. I hope you will check out also Front Row 5 and 10, which is a list show that TC and I do 
where we will do lists about movies or books or music or whatever. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I hope you'll check that out too. I have another solo show. If you happen to be a fan of the CW show Supernatural, you can check out Platinum Rose's Garden, which is my Supernatural podcast where I look at the episode from the past week and do a review and, you know, basically just bullshit and talk and have fun. Uh, TC has some podcasts of his own as well, including uh, Catastrophe Vortex, which is his disaster movie podcast. He is a disaster movie junkie. I am not. and But he's very, very knowledgeable about that stuff, so I hope you'll check that out. He has a Three-Minute Weekend and Tuesday Digidex, which are shows that are looking at new releases for the week, so it'll help you plan out what you're looking for. And there's also Cave Babble from Eric and Valerie, our good buddies that uh, have a, uh, their own podcast. They're really awesome people. And if you get a chance, if you could please check out Manhattan Hammer Down, which is a project that we did. Oh, also real quick, uh, Comic Grotto with Aunt B and Pee Wee. Uh, back to Manhattan Hammer Down. Manhattan Hammer Down is a, a project that we all worked on, uh, in, in, uh, Concurrence with the 10 year anniversary of the release of the film Cloverfield. And, um, I hope you will go take a listen to that. It was a real big labor of love and we worked super hard on it. And I hope you'll give it a listen and, and enjoy it and send us some feedback. Um, and any of our shows, if you like them, put, you know, like it on Facebook or wherever you want to like it, uh, share it and, uh, tell other people about it, link up with us. You can find all that stuff in, in the technical, uh, you know, wizardry that's on the computer because that's TC's department and not mine because I'm the cute one and I don't know anything about computers. So, uh, that is going to wrap it up for another week here on Ring Around the Rosie. I hope you enjoyed my show for the week and I will be back next week at my regular time. I hope if everything works out okay. So this is Kim Brown, aka Platinum Rose Lady, signing off for another week, guys. Have a great week out there. Bye. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7. The